Will all the Apple One uh, owners from the uh, group come, come to the stage as well as any uh, early Apple employees who are still in the building? I know some have left for the day, but please come on down. Anyway, so up, up here we've got um, some Apple owners. We've got original Apple owners. Um, we've got people who are new to being Apple owners. So we've got kind of the gambit in the mix. And if you don't know who I am, I'm Corey Cohen, and I am kind of the go-to guy for many of the auction houses to um, restore Apple Ones and do repairs and things like that. But I'm also an owner as well. Does that also mean I'm a member? Uh, whatever. Um, so we are, you know, one of the things that people ask me is like, are you crazy for buying one of these things? So you will notice some of us are not saying it's okay. We will not, you know, we'll get into some of that. But uh, the first thing I want to ask uh, the audience, well, ask the panel, excuse me. And um, I think I would like to have stalled and gotten more Apple employees up here, but how many people worked at Apple who are, who are up here? Not too bad. So these guys worked at Apple and grabbed your boards, and we'll ask the stories of those. And I bet you they're similar. Uh, earlier on today, we also had uh, another early Apple board owner, who um, Dr. Wendell Sander. He was running around here, but he couldn't stay for the for the rest of the day. So um, he he did want to, you know, join and come in, but he really couldn't. So the other question is, how many people got their Apple ones in the 1970s? Cool. How many people got them in the 1980s? 90s? Anyone? Cool. And how many people got theirs recently? Within the past five years? Or in some cases, in the past five weeks? So. And Alan doesn't remember. So. Now, you may say there, that there's a lot of boards out there. We've had at any one point today, there were 14 Apple Ones in here, and uh, there were like four that were being worked on or running So at one point. So we've had quite a few, and there's also one downstairs, which we're not counting in a lot of this. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, so the first thing I'm going to really ask is probably the obvious question everyone wants to know, and not how crazy or what do our bank accounts look like, but I just want to know, and I'm sure the guys want to know, is how'd you get into computers? You know, I'm going to pass the microphone down, but I also want you, because at this point, introduce yourselves because it's the first time we're hearing from you. So I'm going to start. We'll start down here. Make it quick. Okay, so how did you get into computers? 1970s. Yeah, a little closer. In uh, 72, somewhere there. And uh, I, I used to come down here. I'm from Montreal, Canada. And <clears throat> I'm from Montreal, Canada. And um, <laughs> you don't have to give your full name, but you do have to at least give your first name. Okay, I'm Krishna Blake. And um, I was actually, the, the, how the actual transaction happened was there was no service for Apple IIs in Montreal at the time. And when, um, when a retail store started selling Apple IIs in Montreal, I, one day I walked in there and I see all these boxes lined up. And I said, oh, those are new. He says, no. We're preparing them to ship them back to California because that was the only way they could get their warranties. And so um, I offered them, if I charge the same amount as you guys are paying for the freight, would you allow me to do the repair? And they did. And I ended up doing thousands of them. And it was 45 bucks each to ship to, to Florida. Uh, sorry, to California. In 1977. That was 1977, the end of 77. And so, go. No, 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 I just wanted to. So think about that in today's dollars, and we still complain about what Amazon charges if you're not a Prime member. 
<laughs> so that, that started me in that era. I was in business systems before that. Um, but then when I started servicing the Apple IIs, it was just boom. And uh, one day the salesperson called me and said, um, I have a guy here who says he has something called an Apple I. I'd never heard of it. And he came back to see me and he asked me, you know, don't you know that Apple is offering um, an upgrade? <clears throat> I said, no, I called Apple and it did not apply to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so I made a deal with him. I had several used and repaired Apple IIs. I learned only much later that I was on the losing end because they were charging a lot more for the upgrade than I did. <laughs> so that's how I acquired it. That, that's, that's it. So, uh, I'm, um, I'm Brad, and I'm a long-term computer user. Hi, Brad. Um, so started building, so the Altair was too expensive, so I built an 8080 from scratch, and uh, I learned so much by debugging that that I started working at a computer store which in Oklahoma City in 77, which became Apple's first um, Midwest distributor. And so I wrote a field service manual, and I went to go visit the factory in 78, and they were using the field service manual to fix new boards and uh, had shipped it out to all the other distributors. So they had a great wall covered with Apple IIs that were, had been broken sitting there for weeks. And they're like, yes, yes, we'll pay you minimum wage plus something to come and fix all this stuff. Anyway, after I'd been there for a few months, uh, I traded uh, another uh, person on the manufacturing floor, Randy Peterson. I, I had a videotape recorder. I traded him for a couple of Apple Ones. And I gave away one of the Apple Ones in the early 2000s to a student from Carnegie Mellon. Kept one, but all through school. So I got, had an Apple. I sold Apple IIs my, when I was working there because that's how I paid for my school. And if you're wondering... If you've worked at Apple and wonder why they have such strict rules on buying and reselling computers, that's me. Um, but I kept the Apple One, and that's what I use for all my engineering projects. So, you know, peaks and pokes and just a, a straightforward monitor and the parallel port is just great for doing uh, engineering projects. Good afternoon, I'm Bob Roswell. I'm the newest member of the club. Um, I'm not really a member of the club. I don't own the Apple One. I run a computer museum, a nonprofit, which now owns the Apple One. A little louder. A little louder. Um, the question was, how do we get into computers? How many remember the plastic Digicomp computers? The Digicomp One and the Digicomp Two with the rolling balls? I had those, had those in the 1960s. Uh, ended up majoring in computer science. Um, summer of 1980, um, a girl who I liked had a summer job in Washington, so I applied to work at uh, Computerland Number 7. Uh, had fun there, called my buddy Maury, said, let's do this. So we opened up the Computerland franchises in Baltimore, and we've been doing that for the last 39 years. Um, 39 years of solving people's computer problems. I have fun by setting up a computer museum. And we now have tours. It's a small version of what's downstairs, uh, running on a much smaller budget. And we're real happy to have uh, an Apple One and invite everyone to come visit uh, if you're in the Baltimore area. Um, hello, uh, my name is David Okada. And, um, I know I'm gonna like. I know I'm gonna slow everything down, but David's going public today for the first time that he's an Apple One owner. He's had one for a long time, and it was always known as Dave from Arizona. Now he's actually going public. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Well, I, I grew up in Hawaii, and I was born in the same year as Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, and I went into engineering. So at college, um, I was exposed to microcomputers, and I got really interested in the hardware, and, and um, so I got this interested, interest in collecting computers. So in um, 1985, I saw an ad in, I think, Computer Shopper for someone selling an Apple I. So I, I purchased it in 85 and um, kept it since. And uh, I guess just yesterday, Corey got it running after sitting in my uh, closet for all these years. So um, basically, that's the story of my computer. Hi, my name is Par Crone. Um, I first got my start. Uh, oh, sorry. My name is Par Crone, and uh, I, uh, as a kid, I decided I wanted to own a computer. And the Apple One was uh, in the Byte magazines for sale, and I was about ready to buy an Apple One. And then they came out with the Apple Two, which spoke integer basic, and so I decided to buy that one instead. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I played with that a lot, and uh, I wound up actually getting my first uh, real computer job because I, uh, this was back in 1978, because I actually, not only did I know what a computer was, but I actually owned one, and so I got a job uh, at a place called the Computer Room in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and uh, Along the way, they hired a couple of other people. Chuck Warner was one, and Alex Ellingson back there with the uh, camera is another one. And uh, uh, fast forward uh, to 1983, Chuck and I left and opened up our own computer store. And uh, one day I had a customer that came in, that uh, guy came in that said he was looking to get a computer, but he didn't have any money. And uh, that was in 1989. Yeah, that was 1989. And he said he had an Apple I. And we had uh, uh, the 486 computers had just come on in, and we, we had a 386 single 386 computer left on our shelf. And, uh, and uh, he didn't have the Apple I with him. I said, well, bring it on in, show me what you got. He brought it in, and I, uh, he said he just wanted a computer he could do something with because he couldn't do anything with the Apple I. So I pointed at that 386 computer and said, you want to trade for it? And he said, sure, I'd love to have it. So I loaded up the 386 computer in his car and uh, got the Apple I, and Chuck and I have been sitting on it for forever since here, and we're it's now uh, with... R and R auction, and we're going to have put it. We finally decided to, that we want to sell it because we're getting a little bit gray in our hairs, and uh, so we're going to have it at R and R auction here in December. And here's Chuck. So, so Par told most of our story, but my story for as far as how I got into computers, I think is different than probably everybody else on the, on the panel here. I was selling real estate in Kalamazoo, Michigan in my early 20s, mid-20s, and the guy that owned the store, that, that was the, the computer room, the guy that owned that uh, computer room owned a chain of stereo stores. And um, he got enamored with, with personal computers somehow and, and that's why he started the computer room, which was a room in his, one of his stereo stores. And he hired a guy to come and, and manage that for him uh, from California who worked for Apple. Tom Walker was his name. And Tom Walker came to Kalamazoo looking for a home. I sold him a home. And uh, in my life, I was a high school dropout. I, I'm, I, you know, I on Maslow's pyramid, you know, I was just trying to put food on the table, and 
for me, everything in my life has been about adjacencies, and, and I, I never really pursued what I loved, per se. I pursued whatever would get me the next rung higher. And I was listening to this guy. You get to know somebody when you're going to sell them a piece of, of real estate. And what he was going to be doing was... I had no idea, really, but I was intrigued. I didn't know what a personal computer was, but somehow, intuitively, I thought this might be an opportunity. And I had been in the Army. I, had, I was drafted, and in the Army, I worked in the... I was in Korea, and I worked in the Finance Corps. And what we were doing in the Finance Corps in the, in the early 70s, that was, was we were converting the payroll system from a manual payroll system to a computerized, a punch card computerized system. I really wasn't what I was personally doing, so I was part of a team in Korea participating in that effort. What I was personally doing was going through financial men and women in the Army's financial records, sort of manually auditing them to make sure they were accurate to get ready to be input. So I'm listening to this guy and going back to that idea that I was always looking for the next. So I sort of embellished my Army career so that I had something in common. And it, and it, it worked. A couple of days later, I got a call from the guy. He said, you're the greatest salesman I ever met. How would you like a job selling personal computers? So I ran down to the internet of the day, which was the library, to try and figure out what in the hell a personal computer was. I thought, man, I, I learned a little bit, didn't get a lot, but I was, trying, I was figuring it out, and I thought, well, I found out Radio Shack sold them too. So I thought, well, maybe I ought to go over to Radio Shack and see what, whether they'd be interested in hiring me, and by God, they were. So I had two offers, and I eventually took the offer at the computer room, I glued myself to par uh, so that I could learn what I needed to learn. And so everything I've learned, I've sort of learned by the seat of my pants. And that's how I got into computers. So. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Since we're starting in the beginning, uh, I started with computers as an undergraduate in business school, uh, writing programs in Fortran for an IBM 360. And they were really interesting programs, of course. You know, we were so deep into it, we're trying to figure out, for instance, how many elevators you'd need to put in a new office building, or how often you need a rest stop on an interstate. Uh, but the nice thing was, and the reason I would encourage you, if you're ever talking to students, even if they don't want to be a programmer, I'd, I'd highly advise them to take a, at least one course in programming so they understand the process you know, what it can do, what it can't do, or how it, how it does what it does, really. Because later in life, they really paid off. I, I liked your story about running out of the library to find out what a personal computer was. As an undergraduate, I was offered a job trading OTC on Wall Street. So I thanked them and said, you know, can I get back to you? Because I was told, you know, you never take a job right away. And I got a phone as soon as I could and called my dad to find out, what does OTC stand for? Of course, OTC in the financial markets is over the counter, and this was pre-NASDAQ, but today you'd say NASDAQ, and I started trading NASDAQ. Well, uh, the first 14 years I'm trading NASDAQ, if not every week, certainly every month, someone asked me if they could put in a stop order over the counter on NASDAQ. Anybody here buy stocks? Okay. And <laughs> uh, anyone ever put in a stop order? Okay. Uh, so a stop order, typically, let's say a sell, that could be a sell stop or a buy stop. A sell stop would be an order below the current market. Normally, you think of putting a sell order above the market, and you'd sell when it gets there. You put in a stop order below the current market, so if the stock price drops, you sell out. Well, on an exchange, that's not such a difficult process. There's one specialist they can monitor the order. If the price gets there, they know. In NASDAQ, not so easy because there can be 35 or 40 market makers, and while they're connected through NASDAQ, they're not connected directly to each other. 
Uh, but in the early 1980s, I finally came up with a way, literally in the middle of the night, woke up, and I'd figured out how to do it. Fortunately, I keep a pad and a pen in my nightside stand and wrote it down. I was afraid to go back to sleep. And, and then in the morning when I woke up, I, I thought, did I really think of it? And I, I opened the drawer, and sure enough, I had actually written it down, and it needed a little bit of work, but the basic, the kernel of the idea was there. So we implemented that, and uh, two months after we started that, that was 30% of our orders at a major firm were stop orders. That kind of worked. But if I hadn't had the programming uh, background, I wouldn't have been able to figure out how to make all that work. So I didn't do the coding, uh, but I, I wrote the specs for the coding. Uh, about that same time, 1985, I bought my first Apple, uh, waited for the Macintosh, waited for the 512, uh, and my son was uh, two years old. He started, he started up early on it. He developed an interest in it, so I started thinking, well, it'd be fun to go back and collect some of the old Apples and Maybe one day he'll have a collection. And my wife still wonders why we have all these things on a shelf in the garage. And uh, well, my son still has an interest. You know, he's living in an apartment with someone else, and he doesn't have a place for any collection. Uh, but in the uh, mid-1990s, 96, I think, uh, there was an Apple One for sale on eBay, and I ended up buying that. Uh, the seller was in San Diego. We were coming out to San Francisco, my son and I, for the uh, uh, Mac Expo. And I think we paid $20,000 for it. I didn't want to put $20,000 in an envelope to some guy I'd never met. And I, I hope it really is an Apple One, but it's not a clone or something. So I, I called him. I said, how about if I send you $2,500? And I'll pay you the balance when I get there. It's just going gonna to be there in three weeks. Fine. So my son and I are staying at the Marriott in San Francisco, uh, near the Moscone Center. Didn't check out of the room, just went to the airport, jumped on a plane, went to San Diego. I agreed to meet the gentleman in a hotel lobby where I figured there'd be security. You know, I'm from New York, where you don't have to apologize for being paranoid. And uh, sure enough, it turned out he's a, a real gentleman, very nice man. He had bought the Apple One secondhand, uh, and he bought it because uh, he was trying to improve his Spanish, and he just wanted it to use for electronic flashcards. And after that use had worn out, he'd stuck it on a shelf in a closet and sat there and finally decided to sell it, and that's how we had a transaction. But, uh, you know, a lot of fun with computers. You meet a lot of nice people that you would probably never meet uh, if you didn't get involved. Uh, so I'm delighted you're here. I hope you meet a lot of nice people as I have and, and you enjoy your time here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alan Baum. My interest with computers, how I started, my father brought me to some demo of the HP 9100 in the 60s sometime when it was first announced. I'm not sure how many of you know what it is, but it, it's a wonder and a marvel in, in very many ways. And of course, there's one in the museum. Um, and I thought it was pretty cool. I, you know, I just learned uh, how to do quadratic equations, and I could type things in there and have it do quadratic equations for me. I thought that was amazing. Later, my father brought me into work. He worked at SRI, and on a weekend, there was nobody in the building, really, and I got to see Shaky the Robot, and it's downstairs right over there, I think. Uh, and there was one other guy working on the weekend he, in his office. He had this enormous monitor, and he had this thing rolling around his desk with one hand and this five-keyed keyboard on the other hand. And it was Doug Engelbart, who pretty and much invented the mouse and so many other things. So I was, I was getting pretty interested. And then in high school, I was walking through in the morning before class started in the, the library. There's a guy in the corner and he's drawing these weird diagrams on a piece of paper. And I walked over to him and said, what are you doing? He says, oh, I'm designing a computer. Yeah, you see, here's the manual. And it's a Varian 620i, and I'm going to, you know, using these are gates. And I went, whoa, that is so cool. I want to learn how to do that. So he taught me. And eventually he started this company called Apple, Steve Wozniak. <laughs> so I have a lot of Steve Wozniak stories. 
but that's pretty much, he taught me lots about designing computers, and that's kind of what I still do. Oh, tell us how you got to it. Well, so before, um, originally I was going to ask people separately, like how you got your Apple One, but pretty much everyone here, I think, so far has said how they got theirs. Um, well, not really. You'll give more stories. Well, did you say how totally you just were kind of browsing on your computer and said, "Oh, let me buy one"? <laughs> well, we'll get we'll get back to you. So. Um, We'll come back to the people who didn't tell their story of how they got theirs, but I really need you to tell the story of, you know, how you got yours and all that. So back when Apple first started, uh, my father was a 55-year-old engineer with a heart problem, and because of that, unemployed and no prospects. And so he's asked, he's told Steve Jobs, you know, I'm not doing anything. If you like, need help with something, you know, just let me know. I'll help give you a hand. And to his surprise, um, Steve Jobs hired him. Um, at that time, he, he would have been employee number 11 or 12, but um, because he was an unemployed engineer with heart disease and wanted to get on the medical plan, he had to be a contractor for six, six months. And then when he finally did six months without seeing a doctor, he could claim he had no previous conditions and, and could actually be an employee. So he ended up being employee number 34. And he worked in the, the original um, Good Earth building. Uh, and when they were, and he worked on power supplies. He was an analog engineer. And when Apple started, when Woz designed the Apple II, um, he, you know, and they were, they were kind of transitioning. Steve Jobs decided they weren't going to sell any more Apple Ones um, because they were a maintenance headache. <laughs> They didn't want to have to, to support two of them. And at that time, was the first run of 100 boards where, I don't know, 50 or 75 went to the bike shop. The rest of the original run went, you know, individually. And then there was a second run of PC boards of which they sold 75, more or less, different places. But there was another 25 that were never sold. They were in boxes on Steve Jobs' desk. And I don't know if he said we're going to throw them out or... He said, hey, you know, if you want one of these, take it. Um, but in any case, people grabbed them, and my father grabbed two of them. These were blank boards. They hadn't been populated. And sometime later, he gave them to me, and I couldn't tell you when because I don't remember. And then, uh, but I was acquiring all the little parts that fit in it. Uh, and one of them I gave to a friend, and it's going to be auctioned soon because uh, the friend's son just bought a house. <laughs> um, and I, with, with the help of Wendell Sanders and, and Dan, I got them working. And that's how. Thank you. I wanted to hear your story because I knew it kind of flowed with the whole, you know, this little, little company, Apple, that you could, yeah, so it kind of flowed. So, um, you know, my story, uh, you know, I've I introduced myself earlier, Corey Cohen, but my story of how I got into computers was probably just because I like taking things apart and hopefully putting them back together. And I grew up in uh, Long Island in New York, and I was lucky my dad had the means to buy me lots of electronic kits, and when computers started becoming available, I had access to having a home computer or personal computer, and I was in... I was then and still am an Apple fanboy. And I think my, wa my wife might actually be watching this on streaming and she'll, she may remember the fact that my first IBM PC was actually when I got married to her. Because, so I was an Apple guy through like ever to the 90s. Um, I got into kind of the vintage Apple ones and things for you know, kind of a, you know, a various health reasons, I kind of started reminiscing because something happened with a friend of mine. And I said, you know, I really want to play Star Trek. Like, I played it on my cousin's machine. And it kind of led me into kind of trying to find or build or whatever a vintage computer. And that's how I kind of got into it. Um, the Apple Ones I got into really because um, I had built the replica, but a friend of mine um, was auctioning his Apple One off. Um, in New York, I live in New Jersey now, and um, he lives in Texas, and they were doing a press event. And it worked when they shipped it, it didn't work when it got to New York. 
He couldn't, it was uh, the same day I had to ru drop everything I was doing, rush into New York City and fix that Apple One. Uh, I got it running for the press, found out what was wrong, and um, most of the guys who I worked with at the auction house were from the Antique Roadshow. They were the hosts of the Antique Roadshow uh, in different aspects. Had dinner with them and they kept me on their Rolodex and I started getting calls to go fix and repair Apple One's coming up for auction, and eventually, um, I almost almost bought one over uh, from one of the Houston brothers, um, but I turned that one down. I almost bought one uh, just before Superstorm Sandy, and I couldn't go because of Superstorm Sandy. Um, and I said to my friend Cameron, "Hey, dude, go grab it." And I think he had negotiated some stuff anyway, so I was like, "Hey, this is going to be available." And um, and in the end. Uh, I got the next one that came up uh, amongst the emails of friends. So um, I have one of my, I have uh, an Apple one here. I did not bring my case, but uh, I'm really happy with it. I love it. And uh, I did say it was going to be for my kid's college fund, but my son is in college and I still have it. So <laughs> maybe a grandkid's college fund? All right, this is Will Glass. I'm going to introduce Will, but I'll say a few words first. I'm Dan Kotke. I'm the guy who was building Apple Ones in the Jobs Garage. Um, I didn't know how they worked. I didn't know how electronics worked. I was just assembling and testing them. And to be quite honest, I didn't want one. I had opportunity. I could have had one, but I didn't want one. I was more interested in the Apple II. I was building Apple II, uh, building, I built many Apple IIs out of scrap parts. Um, but to the Apple I story, um, as I said, I never wanted one. I didn't think it was that useful. I didn't have a, I had a music degree. I did not know about computer history at all. Uh, but I was at this uh, vintage computer festival three years ago. No, I met you at the DigiBarn. Yes. So Bob Glass is his father. Bob Glass was head of System 7 at Apple and uh, the OS. And we were at the DigiBarn in Boulder Creek. And I think you wanted me to autograph some piece of Apple equipment. Yes. And then a little bit later, I was at this vintage computer festival. And I thought, well, I don't really, I, I, I didn't really want to build an Apple one. I wasn't, like, I just thought it would take way too long. And it turned out I was right. But I thought, well, why don't I harness the youthful enthusiasm of this young lad here, and I'll find all the parts, and he can do all the soldering, and we'll build a few. And actually, it was a lot of work to find all the parts. Uh, Unicorn used to sell a kit, but they don't anymore. Or maybe you're going to sell a kit. I don't know. It's really, it's too much work. But you can find all the parts on eBay. If you're yeah, if you're patient. And um, uh, well, here now I'll hand it over to Will. But I have a few more words to say about getting my Apple ones working. All right. So I guess I should explain uh, how I got into vintage computing. And I think it all started uh, when I found my dad's Mac SE in the garage uh, in a bag as we were cleaning things out. And uh, I wanted to try and fix it because I think since I was eight years old, I was taking things apart and trying to understand how they worked, and it wasn't working. Um, and so I ended up taking it apart, getting the tools, and fixing it. Um, and then he introduced me to his friend Bruce Damer at the DigiBarn. And Bruce is actually the one who put me in contact with Daniel, and that's how this whole project started. So it's kind of my short story. Yeah. I haven't sold one. I think we started in, what, 2016 building? So I think we built how many? Eight? It's going to be eight. Coming up on eight boards. Uh, um, oh, yeah, I should add, uh, I'm a, uh, going into a senior year of high school. You were just finishing eighth grade when you started this project. Yeah. Okay, what you missed, we were just saying, he was just finishing eighth grade when he got together with Dan to go recreate history and build some Apple One, in this case, replicas, but build some Apple Ones. So... Very cool, very cool. So uh, I'm going to pass down to the final, and then we'll come around. So I'll say, I'll say, 
I'll say a few words about the process because it was way more difficult than I thought it would be. And uh, it's a cautionary tale for anyone who wants to build these machines. So Mike Will Eagle, bless, bless him, you know, makes the Mimeo logic boards. And I had great confidence that the logic board was fine. And so I launched into buying all these parts. And I bought us, I think I bought four boards and I bought enough parts for four. So this was three years ago. I built the first board. It only took a couple days. Didn't work. Damn it. I thought, but I didn't have a known good board. I didn't have known good parts. So I built another board. Didn't work. Damn it. I built a third board. It, well, I was a crack troubleshooter of the Apple II, but I did not troubleshoot the Apple I. I could not read schematics at the time. I did not know enough. I, all I did was test. I assembled and tested them. Um, to, to, anyway, just to wrap up this story, I built a fourth board and it didn't work either. So I was zero for four. And I'm cursing now because I spent thousands of dollars in parts and I couldn't get any one of them working. And if you know about the video section, it's impossible to really follow it with a scope. I'm good now as an engineer, but um, my only breakthrough was I decided idly to start following the cursor signal because it goes slowly. And following the cursor signal, sure enough, I found a bad part and that fixed the first board. And then the other ones came along quite rapidly. Um, so anyway, uh, and then I bought another four, so I'm finishing up the batch of eight. And um, what I did for this show is I put a Wi-Fi module on my Apple One so that it sends emails. And I'll be happy to talk about that. It's over there on a table. Yeah, I can demo it. All right, thanks. Uh, my name is Mitchell Waite, and I am a, an original Apple One owner. And my story starts in 1975 when I was attending the Homebrew Computer Club at Stanford. See a lot of nodding heads. And uh, the two Steves came in and said they had figured out a way to make a computer on a single board about the size of a legal sheet of paper. And everybody just laughed and said, no way, because at the time, Computers were in big boxes, and there was like six to eight boards inside them to run. You might have heard Insi or Altair, MIT's computer. Uh, they said, no, we've really done it. And the next month, they came back, and they showed us the board. And they said, this is it. And the next month, they came back, and they showed us a running board. And everybody just flipped, because they had found out a way to make one little board act like a personal computer that you could talk to for the very first time. You could type into it. It had Waz Basic, it played games, it had full color. It was a wonderful, wonderful machine. And I decided I was gonna buy one and thought that might be the future. So um, I bought my Apple One computer from Steve for $666. He was gonna sell all the parts, but then he changed his mind and said it would be, be he decided to actually sell them to the bite shop that was a much better way to go, because they're too hard, as Dan kind of alluded to, they're too hard to keep running. They're very temperamental. Um, and then I took my Apple One home from the bite shop and I built a weather station on my roof so I could measure the height of the tides, the solar radiation, the temperature, the wind speed. And I should tell this part, is that at the time I was writing books about personal computers, which not too many people believed were ever gonna go anywhere, but, um, Somehow Steve Jobs found out about it and he got in touch with me and he came up and he saw my weather station on the roof of my house, my houseboat. And he said, um, what are you doing with this? I, I really like it. And I said, I'm gonna write a book about it. And he said, oh, that's great, but don't write it about this thing, it's a piece of junk. I said, no, it isn't, it's a wonderful machine. He said, no, it's a piece of junk. We can't keep them working. Come down to this new company I'm starting called Apple and I will trade it to you, an Apple II computer to you for your Apple I, because the Apple IIs are really easy to keep running. Basics in ROM, they start up with a push of a button. The Apple I's a very hard board to get started. Uh, you have to load basic from a cassette tape. So I fo followed up on that, I went down there and I forgot my Apple I, which I really thank myself today for doing that. Um, 
He almost kicked me out, but he changed his mind because he liked my books. Uh, and he offered me the Apple II, as long as I wrote the book about it. And then before I went home, he said, um, hey, wait a minute, I have an offer for you. And I said, what's that? He said, um, how would you like to work here? And I said, at this little company? And he goes, yeah. And I said, I don't know, man. It's kind of small. <laughs> and he said, well, it's, it's going to get really big, and you can be a millionaire if you go to work for me. And I kind of knew about his reputation. I mean, I liked him, but he was kind of hard to work for, I heard. So I was like, well, Steve, I think I'm going to, like, follow my own career, you know. Uh, actually, what happened was I said, okay, I'll take the job. And I said, I just have one condition, that I live in Marin County, where it's, you know, the redwood trees and the forest, and this is like the asphalt jungle down here. So is it okay if I commute? And I'll come in like an hour later. And he said, he looked at me, he said, you look like a bozo, dude. No way. I said, why not? He says, take a look around this office and tell me what you see. I said, a bunch of nerds sitting at their desk. He said, no, look under the desks. I said, okay, what is that? He goes, those are sleeping bags. We don't go home. So if you want to work here, you got to like be here 24-7. I said, oh, okay, in that case, I don't want to work here. And that's when he said I was a bozo, and he almost kicked me out that time, but instead he sent me to Mike Markula to write some articles about the Apple One. I went on to write articles about apples and books about apples and started a whole publishing company and actually had a really nice career and finally sold Weight Group Press to Simon & Schuster. Maybe some of you programmers might have heard from it. C Primer Plus, books like that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and that's my story. And I'm sticking to it. So, as I said, I was initially going to ask everyone to kind of, you know, how'd you get in computers, then how'd you get your Apple One? Uh, who didn't say yet how they got their Apple One? Um, so, we've got... So, we'll pass it down, because I know we don't want to miss those stories, right? Especially yours. Really, it's the newest story, and I think it's really funny. So, I, I run a computer museum. It's a nonprofit, and auctions... Everyone sends me every time an auction or something interesting comes up. And I was in bed here on the iPad, and you can register for the auction. And I put in the minimum, and I forgot about it. And a week and a half later, or two weeks later, whenever the auction happened, an email comes in. And, you know, is it spam or is it real? And it's like, oh, sh what am I going to do now? And then the bills started coming in because the Apple One was in London, and it came with a whole lot of other paraphernalia, a TV set, a monitor, a couple Panasonic, um, tape recorders, a printer. And so then the bill came in for shipping it. And then you have to buy a case for it, and then you buy an alarm system for it. And it's been fun. So. Okay, you may have seen some chairs being shuffled up because uh, not you know some people didn't make it here in time, but we have two more people, uh, two more owners. Come on up. But uh, we'll let. So first thing we're going to ask is um, introduce yourself. Um, and every I was keeping this question separate, but you can go ahead and combine the two. Is how did you get into computers and how did you get your Apple Ones, plural. And tell us about the registry. <laughs> okay. So my name is Achim Bakke. I came into computer business when I was 17. My first contact to a computer was with 16. And I started instantly to write articles for computer magazines all in Germany. So and only in Germany. And I was always collecting old hard drives and old vintage computer. And then someday, an Apple One showed up at eBay. And I thought, oh, whoa, that's, that's a good one. I would like to buy it. And luckily, I bought my first Apple I at eBay. And later, I had the chance to buy a few more. And yeah, well, I, I try to preserve the history of these computers. I truly love the history of vintage computing. And the Apple I computer is a milestone for the Apple company. So that's a prime reason for me to collect the Apple One computer. And it's a marvelous machine, 
And I would say it's art. It's really art. It's not only a computer. And later I had contact to Mike Willigal. He was running the Apple One registry. And someday I was asking him, uh, it looks to me you're not so much more interested in the Apple One registry. Would you handle it to me? And he agreed. And so now I am running the Apple One registry for, I guess, a year or so. And yeah, have a look at the internet. I hope you like it. I try to put all the information I have, if possible, online. So you will find a lot of pictures. You will find some background information. And most important for me, you will find the history of all the Apple One computer. And that's my story. How many? How many are on the registry? <laughs> Uh, on the registry, you will find now 70 that are approved or almost confirmed, and a couple more that are not confirmed so far. And I have knowledge of some computer more, but the owner gave me the information confidentially so far. So I hope to add some. But here, I met two people, and I will add uh, next week or in two weeks two more. How many are working? Hmm? How many are working? Well, okay, so let me actually get to that. So, okay, so there's a two things. Number one is, so um, people say all the time, well, there's, they're not super unique. There are 70 or 60 or 50. Why are they so valuable? Because uh, as Akin points out, it's, they're like art, and they're appreciated like not just art and history. Um, but I also tend to, because I'm, I'm also a car guy, I tend to say, well, you know, there's a Ferrari model that sells anywhere between 25 million and 100 million dollars that they made 50 of them or so, I don't know the exact number, in the 1960s and 35 survive and they're worth between 25 million and 100 million dollars. So it's because, it's, and there are, I'm sure, are cars that are like one of a kind. They don't sell for that. It's, so it's the appreciation of the item. Um, it's the appreciation in this case of the Apple One and that we all love them, that, that is why they're, they're very valuable. Um, and you know, that just has to be kept in mind. The other question we get asked all the time is, uh, how many are there that are working? So any number I have given anyone in the past is wrong now, because we brought up a few of them this weekend, and we'll bring up another one or two tomorrow. That didn't work. Yeah, roughly. So I'd say we're probably at 20 now that are confirmed to be running. Now, when I say confirmed running, that means it's run in the past five years, because at some point, they all ran, sort of. Now, tomorrow, I have a, because she couldn't be with us, Liza Loop, I have a little video, it'll be playing at some point tomorrow, of Liza, and also the owner of the Apple One that's being demonstrated over there as well. Liza Loop has actually the first sold or production Apple One. It was given to her by Steve, by, Steve jo um, by Steve Wozniak, excuse me, who had to pay for it, I might add, because Steve Jobs didn't give, him the, give it to him. Um, and that particular computer never ran right, ever. So you weren't there, you know, you weren't there yet. So you know, it's, it was a lack of quality control by not having Dan there. So, um, so, you know, just, so we get that asked a lot. So now we'll get back to the regularly scheduled program. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Dana Carlton. Um, my, first, my first Apple One I picked up a few years ago from a fellow that had a computer shop in Northern California. I'd been looking for a premier one that was virtually mint for about 20 years and finally found one. And we got it on the registry anonymously. And I started doing Fortran programming right out of college. Got my first Apple II. Um, put a massive 10 megabyte hard disk on it wow. with uh, 8 megs of RAM, um, which was monumental. The people from the, the Apple user group would come over just to look at it and try to figure out why I needed so much space. But um, as far as the number of Apple ones that are actually working, what they do is they, they turn them on, and if they don't blow up, that means they're working. But that's not really mean, that's not really working. You have to actually, 
hook up programs and see if they really work. So the number of truly working Apple One computers, even though they say it's 20, is probably far less than that. Um, the ones that are actually virtually mint are even probably fewer than that. Some of them have little modifications, which are charming and important, but um, there's, there's two ways to look at an Apple One, like we were talking about. Yeah, exactly. You look at it mint, and you look at it um, as, as the story. Right. So a lot of the people up here have different storied Apple Ones, and a lot of people up here have actually virtually mint Apple Ones that, have never, that haven't been used yeah. or been turned on, and they've run Star Trek. You know, or the equivalent. But it's a piece of history and it's a piece of art. It's the first real personal computer that was really a computer that you could modify and you could run programs with. So historically, it's monumentally important. And it is a watershed device. So that's all I have to say. So um, you actually led to a question that we also get asked a lot, which is, what do you do with your Apple One? Or what did you do with your Apple One? So um, first things first, there are some Apple Ones which have what we call provenance, which means documentation showing you know, kind of its life, um, that have been used for interesting things, like a weather station. Um, the governor of Illinois today has an Apple One that was actually used for um, in an automobile shop, believe it or not, in, the, in, you know, in 1976, when it was bought, uh, it was probably a few thousand dollars to just have something up on top electronically that said, number 12, you are served. <laughs> so someone thought the bright idea to buy an Apple One, custom code the proms, so it actually never ran as an Apple One initially, and display Number 12, you are served. And, and it had a push button to advance it, and that's all it did. And it was assembled for less than $1,000. Pretty amazing, right? Um, it actually is functioning as an Apple One right now. I think, I'm not 100% sure he has it on display at one of his businesses, but kind of just an example of things people really did with them. Um, things that, uh, for example, I wish Wendell could have stayed. Wendell Sander, um, actually played games on his. And he had ri written a Star Trek game that was based on the ones from, you know, the, base, the deck basic computer games book. And uh, that actually, I think, led to his job at, at Apple when he went to show it off to, you know, the port to Steve Jobs. And, you know, without that, there would have been a lot less things. Yep. And, you would, and you would have actually not had a uh, headphone jack on the iPhone a lot sooner because he designed the headphone jack. Um, anyway, so uh, when, you, uh, when you think about what did people do, um, so who had their computer back in the day not? So we have one that had a useful use for it. Um, you guys, you used yours a little bit, right? He had one over here. He assembled one and did some programming, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, so we should add that. Yeah, so the, the Apple, the blank boards my father grabbed off of Steve Jobs' desk were not my first Apple One. My first Apple One was one that was given to me uh, by Steve Jobs, probably, uh, to play around with. And people know that Steve Wozniak is an incredible designer, but what they don't know is he is the fastest, most accurate touch typist you will ever meet. He's incredible. His fingers are fast and he's accurate. At the Homebrew Computer Club, he used to bring an Apple One and he used to type in basic by hand in hex during the intermission, okay? I'm not that good. So I'd go and try to program the, the oh, oh, and of course, he could just look at it and say, oh yeah, jump, you knew all the op codes. I'm not that good, so um, I'd type stuff in and kind of do it and then try to run it. It wouldn't work and I'd have to go, and I decided this is, this is too much work. Why don't I write a program that will actually disassemble so after I type something in, I can you know, read it back and see if it's what I intended. And that's how the uh, Apple One disassembler came. Um, and then later, 
later, um, they decided that, hey, you know, we got this disassembler. What would it take to do an assembler? And um, either Steve Wozniak or I, and I actually don't remember which, said, you know, let's do it really stupidly. We're going to have a, we're going to take the code, you know, that you've written, and then just call a subroutine that calls the disassembler with every possible opcode till we find one that matches. <laughs> really simple. And so there was a disassembler in less than 256 bytes and an assembler in less than 256 bytes. <laughs> oh. Another Steve Wozniak story over there. I'm not sure people have heard. Yeah. They, the oh, Apple one. Since we have some, you know, guys with some good stories, feel free. We can so we can pass the microphone around. Do people really want to hear stories about like Steve Wozniak or Steve Jobs or things that? So cool. So we're gonna pass it around a little bit because uh, that's you guys are here to you know see some interesting or hear some interesting stuff. So. So some people have Apple One boards there with the original cassette interface. The story behind the cassette interface is well, Steve Wozniak was working at. HP at the time, and I actually got him his job there. Um, and he actually, they paid an HP engineer to design a cassette interface. Now, HP engineers are very good, and they build things that are absolutely bulletproof. And he came back with this board just full of components. And Steve Wozniak looked at it and said, that's, that's just way too much stuff. It shouldn't take that much. And he redesigned it with, what? two ICs and a couple of resistors. <laughs> that's, that's Steve Wozniak. Hmm? Three? It was two prongs. Okay. Okay. <laughs> You're talking about the cassette interface, not the, not the disk interface? No, the interface. Okay. Because he did the same thing with the disk interface. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was famous for looking at something and going, that just will cost too much. Um, to his own detriment sometimes, because um, he created the game Breakout for Atari. And he famously tells the story how it was the most efficient and tight design he could do. I think he got mono doing it because he stayed up for three days. And um, they couldn't use it because no one understood it except Steve, except Waz. So, you know, he was really good at this. Um, at the time, so just to put this in perspective, at the time, if you owned an Altair and you had a cassette interface, the same time as the Apple One came out, the cassette interface was probably 60 or 70 circuits, uh, integrated circuits on the board, and ran about 300 baud, so 300 bits, you know, at a time per second here, 300 bits per second. The Apple One cassette interface, which was not compatible with anything else, ran at 1200 and cost probably about $3 in parts. So it was pretty amazing. Uh, another quick story that um, I know he's told is with the disk interface, was they, they, he realized that they didn't need all of the disk drive as you ordered it from the supplier. So he realized he could make this simple board and get around a bunch of it. So, they, so the manufacturer really wanted to sell a more expensive version of the drive because you know, Apple was negotiating to be a little cheaper, not having this extra analog piece board going on. So they sent him defective drives. He didn't know they were defective. He thought it was his stuff. So he made a, uh, a tester to calibrate the drives. And it worked wonderfully. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so yeah, that was, a, that was an interesting but fun fact is that they tried to stump him. He didn't know. He just worked around it. And in the end, he still did it without that extra board. OK, so we're going to ask each other questions. <laughs> so Dan, when you were working, did you have access to an Apple II schematic on the, on the production floor? Hold on, let's make one second. So just so you guys know, it's really loud for you out there. We can barely hear it over here. So that's why we're kind of leaning in. Did you guys have access to an Apple II schematic when you were on the production floor? Do you remember ever seeing an engineering drawing for the Apple II board? For the, for, for the circuit, yeah. 
So you're jumping to the Apple II now. Now, at the time of the Apple I, we had schematics, but I didn't know how to make any sense out of a schematic. So uh, and Waz would show up every couple of weeks, and he and Steve would have a little debug session going through the boards that were defective. Um, in the Apple II days, we had schematics. Uh, I often, I was the, the hotshot Apple II repair person. I had the whole schematic pretty much memorized, you know, and, and what I, but what I used a lot was a bare board, and I was always follow, I would stick a um, paper clip in to follow a trace. I would like follow traces around the board to find out where it was likely shorted or, uh, so that was the main, I still have that board. <laughs> It was very useful. And there were three flags. Okay, yeah. I'm going to go find the other microphone. I'm going to go find the other microphone that I know is here. So the reason why I asked was I wanted to tell the story because um, when I was on the, on the production floor, this is 78, right, there, were, there was the red, the red book, which had the schematics in the back, but there were no, um, there were no, there were no engineering drawings. They didn't release any engineering drawings. So we got in about two months after I got there, Waz pulled all the technical staff the, the, on the floor into a meeting, and he wanted to have an after-hours training session. And he asked, he was asking, and of course I worked on it a lot, right? And I knew the system in and out, knew pretty much how the video worked and how stuff, but he was asking, you know, specifically, how do these registers work, sort of, you know, poking us, right? And he was really pissed when nobody knew exactly how it worked. And after the meeting, I, you know, I, I talked to him and I said, you know, we don't have schematics for this because they, what they did when they published the Red Book, they changed all the schematics so you couldn't copy it. So nobody actually, nobody on the production floor for the first year and a half of production. So we, after that, we went back into the engineering lab and got the and, and had and had copies made of the prints. So from that point on, we could actually follow the schematic. But before that time, all the debugging was done by rote. And I always kind of wondered if you had ever seen schematics, proper schematics, when you were there. Well, your story really surprises me. The only schematics I ever had were copied from the Red Book. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. And and I'm not sure he ever got over that, but you know. <laughs> so, um, before we open it up to uh, questions from the audience, um, does anyone else up here have a question for any of the other uh, people on the floor? Just a couple of quick things, and maybe you're all hardcore and you know all these stories, but I, I found it fascinating. Um, Daniel, in the uh, biopics, they always show a crowd of people working in Steve's garage. Uh, how many people were actually working in Steve's garage? Uh, that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> so if you wonder who was making the boards in the, Steve's garage, it, it no, was Daniel Kotke. Uh, Steve wasn't even there. The, 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 the main activity going on is me hanging out or, you know, testing boards in the garage. Steve would always be in the kitchen on the phone, right? And then once in a while, Steve would leave, and I, it was my job to go answer the phone that was in the kitchen. So, and then Waz would show up maybe once a week, but not really more. And then Steve and, had his well, sister once working? Well, I started working there, Patty wasn't around anymore. Okay. Yeah, so we should, we should, uh, so, yeah, actually, it's funny you mentioned Patty. I'll let you tell the Patty story in the soap operas, but we, you have to tell that one. But, um, you know, we get asked a lot, so they made them in the garage. No. <laughs> uh, final assembly and testing. They were actually produced um, in a factory, a PC board factory. The first one was a factory, uh, PC board factory, what Atari happened to use. Um, the second one was a company called NTI that made a lot of S100 boards. And it was just one of the things that um, they knew took the longest, because trust me, they couldn't hand solder 50 and deliver them in 30 days. Um, they used a technique called wave soldering to basically solder most of, the, most of the sockets and major components in the board, but then you were soldering jumpers and you were testing and then you were troubleshooting. And some of the boards didn't work ever. Um, Waz's personal board 
Uh, I think a couple of years ago, Wendell had to take a razor blade and fix a defect because it had two address lines crossed. So, wow, first time it ever ran, one of his boards. So, um, you also, if you ask Waz, and you say to him, okay, so um, you designed it at Steve's house, at, at Job's house, and he, no, I designed it at my apartment. So, if people are looking at the uh, sign we have over there for the Apple One uh, group, you'll notice there's apartments that you've probably never heard of. That's where Waz lived. That's where he actually designed and built the prototypes. That's exactly where he coded BASIC. And um, so that's why you know, we included it in the picture. It's not just the garage. So um, I guess I have to have you tell the Patty story because when I asked Waz, what was the biggest problem you had in trying to get the 50 Apple Ones out and delivered to the bite shop? It actually directly relates to your story. So tell your story of what, when you walked in and you saw. Oh, I wasn't sure what you were referring to. Well, so Soap I. Poppers. Soap poppers. Uh, right. Well, uh, so I showed up in June, early June of 1976. Um, Patty was, Patty was plugging the chips into the Apple One. Patty, Steve's sister, Steve's younger sister, who had a job at Taco Bell. And she uh, was being paid piecework, a dollar a board, to plug all the chips into the Apple One. And she was doing it on the coffee table and watching the gong show on the family television. And... So I immediately saw my job opportunity. <laughs> and what Steve did is he cost reduced her by paying me $3 an hour. But I could do more than, I could do several boards an hour. Uh, anyway, that's the story, I think. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you told me once it was gong show and soap operas. Because I thought soap operas was a funnier story. But yes, gong show too. That's what uh, I remember. <laughs> So when I asked Waz what was the biggest problem in the first, getting the first 50 delivered in the 30 days, because I, I think you guys all know the story. They borrowed money from someone to uh, populate the boards. So what you need to understand is, in the stories they tell, they say, oh, they went to this chip place and supplier, and they said 30 days, and the guy called to see who these two you know, hippies were. You also have to remember, they had to have the boards made and they had to have the sockets put on and all those other pieces. So this man, is, his family is, thank, is really the reason why we have Apple because they could have borrowed all the parts they wanted. If they didn't have the boards to put them in, who cared? So in order to get you know, those boards done in 30 days so they could pay the chip place, they had to have 50 working boards delivered to the bite shop. Hey, Waz, how hard was that? There were a lot of bent pins. So as she was watching TV, she more often than not bent pins under the, uh, under the <laughs> in the sockets under the chip. So that was what he told me was the hardest part, which is actually pretty scary because if anyone has built a computer back in 1976 or 75 like an Altair, you wish that was your only problem. Right. So in, uh, that reminds me of a comment I would make about Ron Wayne. So Ron Wayne was the famous third partner, third founding partner of Apple. Apple, before it was incorporated, it was a partnership. And uh, the thing that actually precipitated Ron Wayne to back out was the day that Steve Jobs called him all excited and goes, Ron, I just bought $30,000 worth of ICs on 30 days credit. Isn't that great? <laughs> and Ron, uh, Ron was a homeowner. Uh, he was the only person who would have been liable for the purchase order. And he, he thought, he just, he, that's why he backed out. That's why he sold his 10% share of Apple back to the owners. I'm not really sure what the amount was. Many billions of I dollars today. Right. And he, by the way, he does say he does not regret it because at the time, it was a very sound decision. So 
Yes, yes, I, I, I totally sympathized with him when I heard the story. Yeah. So uh, we're going to open it up to any questions. Uh, you didn't have any fun Steve Jobs stories, I know. So if anyone doesn't know, Dan is the guy who also traveled around India looking, looking for all, you know, be here, be now. Yes, uh, be here, with be Steve. now. <laughs> uh, yes, later. Housemates later. So uh, do you have any good stories you want to tell us you haven't told before? Or have you told them all? Or that you can't tell them because people involved are still alive? Um, I don't know. Um, but on the topic of the, of the Apple One, since that's our theme yes, today. Yes, that is our theme, but we always like okay. tidbits. <laughs> I, was a, I was a math wizard in high school. I won my school math award two years in a row. And I had gone, I had taken a, a Stevens Institute of Technology summer course on the PDP-10 in nine, before I went to college. So I knew, a little, and I thought Octal was stupid. I thought punch cards were stupid. I didn't have any patience for it. But when, the, but when I showed up in Cupertino to help Steve build his Apple Ones, I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to learn this stuff right away. And so I got the... Uh, Steve gave me a 6502 hardware manual and the software manual, and I'm like studying it and studying it. And after weeks of studying these manuals, I still did not understand how the processor knew where the opcode was coming from. Like, how did the processor know what it was doing? And, and it took me an embarrassment. And when I asked Steve... Steve was a kind of like, if, like, need to know basis. He didn't really, he could have explained it all to me right away, but he never did. It took me months and months to, to learn about reset. Oh my God. Reset <laughs> starts the program counter at zero and then it increments. Is that hard to explain? No. Anyway. He could have just told you, but that's not told me. Steve. Uh, that's right. But now it's a funny story, oh, I guess. <laughs> yeah, okay, so we're clear. We, Except I slip once in a while, we call Waz, Waz, and Jobs Steve. So, though they are the two Steves. So that was a Steve Jobs story, <laughs> a bit. Yes, an Apple one. He could have just told you. I know. I, I was so amazed later. Anyway. Yeah. Let's see. On the subject of Steve Wozniak, uh, uh, I, we visited his apartment at the Villa Serra on Homestead Road. That's where he lived. And I was so amazed. His kitchen table was just piled feet deep in parts and pieces. He was taking apart video, video recorders, which were quite new. Cartridge vision, I don't know, he got some surplus. He was disassembling them and messing around with them. And I, I, I was just amazed at that. Well, you know, so Waz also benefited from uh, something so if you were an HP employee or an engineer, there's a parts closet. And it's kind of a thing where you could back then, and I was an HP engineer at one point too, so um, it's kind of, even to, I, would not, I don't know if today, but even to when I was there, you know, 14 or whatever years ago or 12 years ago, whatever, there was the idea of a parts closet. If you figured out to make something useful, you can just take the stuff, just HP had first rights of refusal. You couldn't, you know, and, you know, so there's, it's, that's kind of talked about a lot in the movies where, you know, Jobs was kind of ticked off. They had to offer the Apple one to HP. But the point is, I bet you a chunk of those parts were probably out of the parts closet too. And he probably grabbed a few every time. Um, not all parts closets were created equal. I was working at HP Labs, and our parts cabinet was, <laughs> had more stuff than his, so I supplied some of those parts. And uh, it must be mentioned, you must have been in McCollum's uh, electronics class at Homestead High, and he famously used to bring parts from the flea markets for the kids to mess with. That's what I heard from... Oh, okay. I, well, I heard he had a parts closet of random parts. Waz had a unique 
debugging technique when he, because when we started in high school, what they taught you was tubes. And if you know anything about tubes, um, they use 200 volts, 400 volts, you know, whatever it takes. And his debugging technique was, okay, yeah, there's voltage on that one. Uh, By the way, um, if you've ever, I think there are videos on YouTube, just to give you a, some fun examples of things you shouldn't do today, but were common practice in the day. Um, for, have you, if you've never seen Steve Wozniak solder, oh, he solders with the lead, leaded solder in his mouth as his third hand. Oh, he must have taught you, right? <laughs> so it's, it's amazing to see because if you've ever seen a hand-wired board, I've seen some of yours, yours are pretty amazing too. A hand-wired board, you can't do it as a human being with two hands. I always wondered until I saw him solder. <laughs> holding a piece here, holding the piece here, and so, you know, holding the iron and then... <laughs> so, anyway. His, um, his boards were works of art when he hand-wired them. They were amazing, they're gorgeous. They are, and many of Not, those boards, if you ever get down to the Atlanta area, um, they are in a museum down there. He, um, the museum, I think it's called Museum of America. I may have the name wrong. Um, museum of it is Museum of America, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to open up and let the audience ask some questions. So I'm going to come down. We don't know if there'll be feedback. We're going to try it. If there's feedback, we'll have to just hear it and repeat it. Or, well, it could get crazy to come up. Um, we'll, just, we'll just try it. Are you going to try it? He's got a microphone there? We have two mics. All three. And the person actually who just held that up's name is Mike, and he was making a joke about that. So, okay, so we've got a question coming. So actually, I if it's for a specific person, please ask. If it's a general question, just say. Well, I actually have a great Waz story that I had to tell. Um, the, memories, the memories were really expensive, and Gordon Moore, Steve's dad knew Gordon Moore, and so um, he said, you know, my friend, my son, Steve, and his friend Waz are working on this thing. They want to build a computer. And the memory was too expensive. So Gordon Moore just gave it to Steve's dad. And then Steve uh, gave it to Waz. But he never told him where the memory came from. So I had to tell Waz where his memory came from. And it came directly from Gordon Moore for the initial computers. Waz just cared that it was cheap or free. Yeah, I mean... That's why I engineered everything out. And yep. we, were, we were the first kids to build an Apple computer because we got kicked out of Intel. Our teacher drove us to Intel, and they said, you can't be here, your kids. So when the Byte store opened up, Wei Li and I, we were 15 years old. We got a bag of parts for $666, and it took us about six months to put it together. But luckily, we had already enrolled in college because it was free computer time, and all these engineers helped us, and it was a great revolution. And Waz is one of the most amazing, nice guys, and he's not here today because he's off on some island, I think. But if you ever meet him, just talk to him, especially as an Apple One owner. He'll just talk to you for a long time. I'll okay. just comment that that, no, it's that not a comment, but I your your story surprises me because I never saw Intel Dynamic RAMs. We no, always they were they were actually Intel Static RAMs. This is when he was first. So the story of the Apple One, just to give you a little quick, without getting deep into it, Waz and Jobs had designed. Well, Waz had designed and. Jobs had sold. Uh, everyone talks about they had, you know, the, the Blue Box, which was one of their products before they had a company. Another product before they had a company was a terminal they had designed. So when Waz saw the microprocessor, he figured, let me grab some RAM. Let me grab a CPU, which he bought out of a jar. And let me put together a computer, because I got a terminal. It's actually one of the reasons why if you watch the Apple ones when they're demonstrating and they run very slowly because they, they're actually a, uh, a board that has two personalities. It's an, a physical terminal and a, C, a CPU with memory and, and, and decoding and they're just wired together on a single board. So, you know, it's kind of, kind of cool, but the first kind of time he got the, you'll call it the pre-Apple one, they didn't even have a name yet, it wasn't an Apple one, he wired up some static RAM he had gotten from Steve, um, you know, and a CPU that he'd gotten out of the jar. 
and he made his first kind of running computer. So that's probably why you never saw it, because um, it really wasn't, it was just kind of the proof of concept for that. And then, Dyna then uh, static RAM is really expensive. And if you're gonna ask your friends to kind of build computers with you, you wanted to find something cheaper. And DRAMs, for the same price as 1K of static RAM back then, you could get 4K of dynamic RAM. So that's why you probably, by then, he had already moved down that path. Right. I believe Steve Wozniak was the first person to use dynamic RAM in a personal computer. And that's because, well, he's Steve Wozniak, and he said, oh, yeah, it's supposed to be really, really complicated and really hard to do, but boy, it sure doesn't look very hard to me. And, and you have to do all this refreshing stuff, but, but I'm already using the video part, and it's, it's scanning through all memory anyway, so that's all doing automatic refreshing. I don't have to do any of that. So the using static... So using dynamic RAM it was completely trivial for an Apple II, but not for anybody else. Hold on. What were the use cases for DRAM before he did it? Why, why was it manufactured? Why were there parts for it? Oh, it was probably for bigger computers. Bigger computers and hardware devices and things yeah. like that. Which would have had a refresh. Hold on. Yeah. So bigger computers and hardware devices and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, they didn't have they didn't really have the DRAMs till later. It was still static, but yeah, but they never worked. So okay. The, the fact yes, that they, they had DRAM cards eventually around this time. Well, remember '76. So yeah, so yeah, they the, did. They had some DRAM ones in '76. You're right, but they never worked right. So. Um, so that, just to give you a difference in ideas between Apple and people want to talk about MITs and things like that. Um, so if you look at the Apple ones, we, uh, we get a common question we get asked, why are those capacitors so big? And there are reasons for them, mostly because they had worked at, Apple, uh, at Atari, and that's kind of how you built a video game machine that had to stay running all day long at the, the bar or the arcade or the pizza joint. So they use the same kind of ideas, which are hi-fi you know, high-end stereo, uh, you know, equipment for their power supplies. Not radio, Lafayette, you know, type radio parts, which the, which the uh, Altair used. Um, the Altair, when they tried doing uh, dynamic memory, it was a lot of chips to support that, first of all. The second thing was they bought the rejected chips from the chip manufacturer as long, and the chip they got a deal or something with the chip manufacturer where they would test them at a higher voltage and if they worked, they would sell them to, so no one else has used these. You can't, it's really hard to find the data, set, data sheet, but they used uh, a 15 volt version, which is odd, of, this, of the dynamic memory and it still was really buggy for a long time until they kind of developed a new card. The, the other interesting part was that, that Apple was selling not just, you know, if you look at, uh, a MITS board or an Altair. There was a video board, and there was a processor board, yep. and there was a memory board. But for the Apple II, it was all in one piece. So they could actually effectively borrow things from one to the other. So the refresh, well, you needed that for video anyway, so it got you, you had got it, it anyway. completely for free. Yeah, so um, actually, you bring up something I wanted. It just, we just, and then we'll go back to the questions. So we lost a very early uh, Apple employee earlier. I think it was this week. And the reason why that brings it up is because there would not be an Apple Soft Basic, um, which is the Microsoft version of Basic, without IMSI. Because uh, two brothers, Houston brothers, um, very smartly rented Apple their IMSI. And they were employees. Um, and it really, a lot of it, I think, gets down to the fact that they lost a, like a month or something when the timeshare service went down. But you couldn't keep the object code you, for, the, for the Apple Basic on an Apple II. It just didn't have enough memory. It wasn't big enough. It wasn't fast. It, it just couldn't do it. So the solution was to rent the MSI from, from these two brothers. And we had lost one a few years ago. And I'm going to actually let you work, you work with the most. or Yeah, I'm going to let Dan just, you know, just want to recognize this and then uh, then we'll go back to questions. Wait, what's the topic? Right. 
Right. I don't remember how the Houston brothers got connected to Apple because I was in production and they were in a different part. But Cliff was very much a mentor for me. Cliff had a long background. He was a Vietnam veteran. He uh, had a long background in printing, which is not electronics. But both those brothers were so smart. And uh, Dick, of course, so Cl Cliff passed away a few years ago. Uh, Dick, who just passed away this week, Dick was responsible for ProDOS. That was his baby. Uh, and Cliff, all right, I have to tell a quick Cliff story. All right, if you, you all know what the Twiggy was? The Twiggy was Apple's uh, fabled uh, double-sided high-density floppy that was supposed to be used in the Lisa. Why did it fail? Well, it just had way too high an error rate. And uh, Apple had made um, a custom head design, and there was a lot of debate over the head design and the, uh, you know, it's uh, Bernoulli principle of error. There's an air gap between the media and the head. And so there were all these arguments raging. And Rod Holt, who's the chief engineer, Rod said, no, it's the jitter in the motor. Well, that sounded plausible. And uh, Rich Wicker, who was the embedded engineer on the project, he said, no, it was the, the problem with the positioning of the head. And what Cliff Houston did, he, he was sure it was actually the head shape. Uh, Bernoulli, uh, air, 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 aerodynamic quality, and what he did was he got a wafer fab vacuum box, and he put the drive in the vacuum box, sucked all the air out, and lo and behold, it worked perfectly. And I thought, oh my God, he's a genius. <laughs> that's a good story. You know, that story could probably only be told at a VCF. I just want to say that because we are all geeks and we get that. So that's actually pretty funny. Now, the irony is that later on, one of the more popular drives, you know, third-party drives for the Mac used the Bernoulli principle. So Bernoulli drive. So uh, I'm going to open this up for another question from the audience. Uh, we got this gentleman here. Hopefully, we don't get any squeaking as I walk past. Okay, I've got a, uh, a couple questions. How many Apple Ones were actually built and shipped? Also, uh, does anyone have a count on known clones of the Apple One? I dealt with Apple II clones, which everybody knows about and knows that. And then also, EDN did a circuit analysis uh, back uh, on, I, I think it was on the Apple II, but there were, uh, they found too many timing issues that said uh, with the unknown components, it would be a problem. So, and that might have been on that one, but I think it was two. And I, I, I've got that archive and I can't locate it, so. So I'm not sure if, uh, it probably was on the one, and I'm gonna work backwards through your questions and then we'll get to these guys on answering some of them. So the Apple One has a very strange RAM timing um, we were troubleshooting that earlier today on, uh, on one of the boards because there was a misprint in one of the spec sheets. And how Waz calculated the RAM refresh timing, um, it puts it completely out of spec for all RAM, all RAM. It just happened to work. And unfortunately, it's, um, it's really specific to the brand of chip you use for this one chip. And that's actually what we ran into today, but there was a solution for it. As for how many were made, one. so 200 boards, 25 never sold. Some people got the, so there were also two phases of grabbing boards from Jobs' office. And the, there was the phase of the 25 unsold boards. And there was the phase of the, these came back because of the trade-in program and they were sitting in a pile, go grab. That's where the Houston brothers had gotten their boards, which um, they had sold uh, not too long ago to, you know, for, for different reasons. And yours was, a, yours was a return board as well. So the return boards were, um, you can keep your RAM, send us the rest. I could tell you, I've seen some of those return boards. They were burnt. They were, you know, lots of things wrong. 
but they're all, there was never truth to the story Steve Jobs wanted them bandsawed. They were, they were souvenirs for everyone. He sent two of these souvenirs to a friend of his down, a school friend of his from like, like middle school. He respected the machine. Yeah, he would say it was crap to everyone else, but he knew. But um, that's why there's so many surviving, is because when they would have normally been thrown out, they were traded in and then rescued by a lot of Apple employees. 175 were sold in different batches. And the so the clones, um, so there really wasn't a clone, an, a proper clone to the Uptronics. Uh, he was an Apple One owner, Steve, I think it's pronounced Gav, Gavney or Gabby or something. He was, a, he was an Apple One owner and he wanted to make a clone. Uh, after that, Mike Willegal couldn't buy one, so Mike spent hundreds and hundreds of hours laboriously recreating the Apple One in a hand creating fonts, curving the lines so they wouldn't be done. Um, and then um, a guy in Hong Kong uh, made a few called the Newton Boards. I understand there's someone in Russia now making them. There's no count on them. Let me just say this. We can tell they're fake. Okay? I say fake because I own, and almost every uh, Apple One owner probably has a replica because we like to play around with them, but most of us probably sit in bank vaults and we go look at them lovingly. So don't come knocking on my door. It ain't there. So um, we're, we're being told we have to wrap it up. So um, unless anyone has the lottery number for tonight, um, I thank everyone. I thank the entire panel. Thank you very much, guys. Tomorrow morning, we will be having a demonstration. I think it's at 10 a.m., uh, live Apple Ones, real ones all running. Um, and Dan will be helping out with that. We will also be emailing people from an Apple One, in this case, replica, but it's really cool, it's emailing people from an Apple One that, um, that Dan put together. And we'll also have some videos from some owners who couldn't make it today, um, talking about their experiences. And if you have any questions for these guys, I hope uh, they're you know, willing to talk to you. Um, just don't be too creepy. We are geeks. This much creepy. So we're here till, uh, till about 6, I guess. Some people might be leaving. But many of us are here tomorrow uh, from the opening. So feel free to say hi. Don't distract me when I have a soldering iron in my hand. I burn easily. <laughs>